This conference will now be recorded. Alrighty, uh, good morning, everybody. As Tricia said, thank you for the introduction. My name is Scott. I'm a park ranger with the Army Corps of Engineers as well. I'm at the same location as Tricia at the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center. And uh, today, like she said, we're doing a program called uh, the Duluth Ship Canal 150 Years of Maritime Transits. Um, the reason why we're doing this program is because um, the canal actually does turn 150 years old next year. Um, the construction finished in 1871. So that's a big deal anniversary and the Army Corps of Engineers here at this location, we take care of the canal and it's a big deal uh, for when the ships are coming through here. Um, just one quick reminder, um, we will be doing, or at least I will be doing uh, interactive portions in this program. So if you could please um, use that chat function as much as possible um, during those little interactive portions, that would be great. And then I have small sections in between places where you can ask questions as well. So we'll go ahead and get started here. A little outline of what we'll be talking about today. It's all going to be focused on the Duluth Ship Canal, as I said. So we'll be going a little bit over what it was like here before the Duluth Ship Canal was built, uh, the factors that uh, led to its construction um, in the 1870s, what happened when it was built, um, a little bit on some local legends that surround its construction, uh, a little bit on when the city of Superior, Wisconsin, on the other side of our harbor, actually fought to uh, have it removed or filled in, and then finally the core connection or how the Army Corps of Engineers came to um, take care of the canal and what we've done with it since the present day. So just to get started today, again, if you could please use that chat function for this little interactive portion. Just as a quick question, when I say Duluth, those of you who live here, those of you who've been here before, have seen pictures, what do you think of? And just send in the chat anything that you think of when I say the word Duluth. It pops into your head. I'll give you a, few, a minute or two. Awesome. We're getting lots of different thoughts here. Very good thoughts. Um, anything from the harbor to shipping, Lake Superior. I think I saw something on the gales of November. That's definitely true. Um, so, yeah, watching the ships and the um, on the uh, live video cameras that we have here, too. So you could be like those folks from Virginia and watch uh, what's going on here on a daily basis. So. Um, like I said, you could be you could be thinking of the outdoors. Um, if you're someone local like me, uh, we have a lot of cool parks in the area. Lake Superior was mentioned a lot. Um, it's very beautiful, the big lake that we have here in Duluth. Uh, shipping, of course, as was mentioned, uh, that's the John G. Munson about two years ago coming through the canal. And then one of the biggest kind of icons, um, especially locally, people think of the aerial lift bridge that we have here at the canal. So um, the aerial lift bridge symbol is seen all over the place if you ever come here and uh, buy any like sweatshirt or anything with Duluth written on it, um, it's gonna have the Duluth aerial lift bridge. It's a very unique and cool structure. But today, of course, I will be talking about the simple structure that sits below the aerial lift bridge, uh, the Duluth Ship Canal, which you can see in this cool aerial photo uh, taken just a few years ago. Um, and what I'd like to argue today with the entire program is that the canal really is at the center of Duluth's identity. It connects absolutely everything you guys has talked about, uh, the lake, shipping, everything. It wouldn't all be possible without the canal's construction. And like I say, it is a pretty basic structure. All it does is allows boat traffic to enter the harbor and exit in and out all the time and not just big ships we also have a lot of sailboats and smaller craft as well and it looks really simple it's just a large concrete structure but it has a big part of Duluth's history 
So now I'm going to take you guys back over 150 years ago before the canal was built, what this area looked like. And it was basically wilderness. Um, this photo here was taken in 1869 in the late 1860s. And the modern canal where, I, where I'm sitting next to today, um, it's located here. Um, Minnesota Point is this long uh, sandy peninsula uh, that goes out into the harbor. And um, as you can see, it's just all pine trees. Uh, we have one early um, settler's home here uh, sitting kind of closer to the photo. And at the time, especially in the late 1860s, there were not a lot of European settlers around here. There were still more Ojibwe and the natives here in the area, but that would soon change in the 1870s. And we'll be talking here in a second. And just to kind of give you a comparison, this is what Canal Park looks like today on the right. You have lots of huge buildings. The aerial lift bridge would be right about here. And uh, it's a lot different than uh, what it looks like today. A lot, lot different. So a little bit of geography in the area. Um, this is that long peninsula I was talking about, Minnesota Point. It's about seven miles long. It's all sand, basically. And here's our natural harbor. That's what the whole harbor looks like. On this side, where my pointer is, this is Duluth. And then on this side is Superior, Wisconsin. And this is all natural sand peninsulas that are throughout. And um, the only entry into the harbor until the canal was built uh, was located down here. And uh, as a result, uh, Superior, Wisconsin had a lot more uh, development with settlers coming into the area. And then, of course, up here is where the modern canal now sits today. Um, for many years, um, the Ojibwe um, that have been here for several hundred years and when the French traders came, this little area where the canal is was used as a portage or a place where they could lift their canoes out of the water and get into the harbor here. And the reason why is because straight back here, there's a fur trading post that would be easiest to go through if you just portaged here rather than going all the way around. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, then, of course, when the settlers did come here in the 1850s, they decided to name the, the Minnesota side after Duluth. Um, he was actually a French trader and um, soldier and explorer that came here in the 1670s. And according to local legend, uh, he did cross where the canal is located today at that portage I just talked to, about. He came to the area initially to help uh, broker a treaty between the Dakota and the Ojibwe uh, to end their, try to end a conflict between them so that the French could easily trade, more easily trade with them. And again, um, like I said, this little area has its own name from the Ojibwe that's translated to Little Portage. And uh, Duluth, the uh, trader, actually crossed in June of 1679 on his way inland. So a little bit into the factors that led uh, to the canal's construction. There's a couple of different factors. The first one is railroads. Railroads were huge back in the uh, mid 1800s. They kind of represented uh, progress and Western expansion. All cities wanted to be located on a railroad or near one because it was um, kind of the source of business for getting people and goods from point A to point B. So the early settlers here actually all fought for land grants, meaning uh, public land that would be given to the railroads to help fund construction. Usually the government would give that land to these railroads to support them building them uh, westward. And like I said, in the 1850s, both Duluth and Superior on either side um, fought to have those land grants so they could attract a railroad up here to help um, build up commerce up in this area. Uh, but Duluth actually won out on that. Um, they were, although land was granted to both, um, financing for the railroad money wasn't given uh, to Wisconsin, but it was given to Minnesota. The reason being, um, the basically the Civil War kind of halted lots of progress on it, but um, lobbyists in Washington were able to make a better argument for funding their railroad um, up to the Duluth side. And the uh, railroad that was started was called the Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad. And it was started from St. Paul, Minnesota, just two and a half mile, or excuse me, two and a half hour drive south of here in 1863 during the Civil War. Um, but because of the Civil War and the fact that construction was really expensive, there was basically wilderness that they were 
building through construction slowed to the point where it stopped. Um, they were somewhere between here, here in St. Paul, um, where it hadn't been done. And this photo actually on the right is uh, the first freight depot. Once the railroad did reach up here, um, this was the first freight depot that was built here in Duluth um, with that Lake Superior Mississippi Railroad connection. So um, with the halt of the construction in steps, oh, actually, sorry, I got out of, out of place here. So another factor that led to the canal's construction was demand for wheat. The whole reason why a railroad would be built up here in the first place and uh, today wheat is still a big part of our cargo here in the harbor. Um, this photo actually shows what it looks like when a ship here in Duluth Superior is being loaded with grain, but Duluth was kind of destined to become a grain port um, just for a couple different reasons. As you can see here, um, this is a railroad map in the late 1860s showing the Milwaukee and St. Paul Railroad. At the time in the 1860s, uh, there was a lot of wheat being grown in southern Minnesota in the upper Midwest. That wheat at the time would be sent via railroad down to Chicago and then shipped over the Great Lakes out east um, for the east coast where it would be used. Um, an advantage Duluth had was that it was actually a, a further west than Chicago and closer um, to the wheat farming that was going on here. So one problem that came up was that it was getting expensive to ship wheat over to Chicago via the railroad. Um, so it would make sense that they would build a railroad to Duluth and uh, ship wheat over Lake Superior to go further east. Another big advantage with uh, Duluth being located up here is that um, although a railroad hadn't been built out there yet, but the uh, Dakotas had a lot of fertile farmland and uh, investors at the time knew this. And that's why the Northern Pacific Railroad was going to be built uh, west, uh, straight west towards the west coast, you know, connected up with this fertile farmland. So they knew that Duluth would be a better option uh, for shipping wheat east again from that location. And then with the wheat and the railroads, in steps Jay Cook. Jay Cook is a huge figure uh, in Duluth's history. Um, he was actually um, one of the richest, if not the richest, um, person in the United States at the time. He was a banker in Philadelphia. He almost single-handedly um, financed the Union in the Civil War. He sold millions of dollars in war bonds to help fund the Union for fighting the Confederacy. After the war, he came, became obsessed with railroads. He believed that um, they would be an amazing investment. There would be a lot of money made as railroads went west. They'd be making money on the goods being shipped east to the eastern seaboard where most of the U.S. was living at the time. And in fact, uh, he got involved with the Northern Pacific Railway, which would go straight west um, from Minnesota. Because of his involvement there, someone with the Lake Superior Mississippi Railroad, the railroad we just talked about that was stalled for construction to Duluth, he was um, in fact, his name was William Banning. Um, he uh, got Jay Cook to invest in the railroad to get to Duluth because it could potentially be a part of the Northern Pacific route that he was already invested in. So he actually came up to this area in the late 1860s and decided, yep, he was going to pretty much invest a lot of money into the area to develop it into a port. Um, so as a result, um, in 1870, Duluth was founded as a city, but um, Jay, it was kind of known as Jay Cook's town because he put in so much money to build up the port, um, anything downtown with all the buildings and the settlers that came up here and the railroad connection, all of it's all, all, all goes back to Jay Cook. So he had a very important role in Duluth's founding. And that legacy can still be seen today. Um, he has a large statue um, in uh, some of the parks nearby. I'm forgetting, I believe it's Leif Erickson Park um, here in downtown um, that um, kind of shows how big of a figure he is. And then on the right here is Jay Cook State Park nearby as well. He had a whole state park named after him for um, the land that was um, turned into a state park that he owned. And here's kind of the first harbor facilities that were built uh, up here in the area. Here again in the background, you can see Minnesota Point, uh, the harbor sitting back, and this is out actually out on the open lake. So right when the railroad was built up here, Jay Cook put in money to build this um, grain elevator here right on the water to load ships called Elevator A. 
um, built 1869 to 1870. And then a breakwater was built out into the lake to help protect ships um, that would load on the other side on the lake here. So that's a pretty cool early photo after um, Elevator A was constructed. But um, there was a problem um, that uh, Duluthians did realize that summer when the city was founded in 1870 that Lake Superior could be a big problem uh, having uh, ships loading out there. So you can see in this historic photo and the photo on the right, um, Lake Superior is known is known for its storms. Um, for you know, ever since Duluth was founded here, there's always been big storms going on here. So, um, and here you can see again Elevator A in that breakwater. Um, but since it's out in the open lake, it still makes um, the ships very vulnerable um, loading out here. So um, Duluthians kind of had the idea that um, if ships had access to the harbor area behind us, behind Minnesota Point that was uh, protected from the open lake, um, that would be a better place to load ships and uh, build docks. So a little, uh, another interactive checkpoint here, a couple of quick questions. Um, just going to go through a few quiz questions here to see if you guys got uh, what I was talking about. First question, why was Duluth destined to become a grain port? Is it uh, A, Duluth is situated at the western point, most point of the Great Lakes. B, the Northern Pacific Railroad was expected to reach fertile grain farming lands west of Duluth. C, grain shipments to Chicago from the upper Midwest have become too expensive. Or D, all the above. What do you guys think? Yes. Yep, you guys got it. It's all these factors combined. It was just simply better situated for uh, wheat farming in the upper Midwest, uh, further away from Chicago, that it would actually make sense to send it to Duluth instead. So all the above. How did Jay Cook invest his money into building Duluth? A, he financed the Union, helping them win the Civil War. B, he financed the Lake Superior Mississippi Road's construction to Duluth, which brought more commerce and shipping to the area. C, he financed the building of Duluth's Harbor, including the grain elevator and breakwater, or D, both B and C. What do you guys think? Yep, you guys got it, D again. Um, so he, like I said, uh, he financed the railroad that was built up here, um, and as well, he was very involved with building Duluth as well as Duluth's outer harbor. So. Awesome. Last question. How did Lake Superior pressure Duluth to build a canal? Was it A, the lake carved out a second natural entry at Duluth? B, the lake's waves and storms motivated the city to dig the canal, giving boats and docks access to the protected bay? Or C, Lake Superior played no role? I'll give you guys a second. Awesome. You guys are getting, getting everything right, which is good. Um, like I just said before we went through these quiz question, questions, the lake storms were a huge issue. So it would make sense to dig a canal so that ships could have access to the protected bay. Any questions so far, just to check anything I talked about what led to the canal's construction. I'll give you guys a second. We haven't gone through too much material yet, so I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't any. Alrighty, I'm going to move on. I will answer a question though in case something comes up. All right, so all those factors combined led to the, the canals digging. So uh, the construction of the canal actually began on September 5th of 1870. We're actually coming up to the 150th anniversary of the start um, in a few weeks here. And the main equipment that was used to dig through the Sandy Peninsula was this steam dredge called the Ishpeming. And if you're wondering, well, what the heck is a steam dredge? What, what does it actually do? Here's kind of a close-up photo. This is a different steam dredge, not the same one, but it's very similar. And all the all a steam dredge is, is it's a basically a barge that they built a steam shovel onto. And you can see that bucket at the end. And basically, they're just operating it, slowly digging, uh, using that steam shovel on the barge to dig sand, um, from the harbor area out to the lake. So it was pretty simple. It did take a long time. It took several, um, you know, the toll time took several weeks. They actually had to stop construction because of the gravel and sand freezing um, when cold weather came through. So it was a very slow process. 
uh, but that was the best technology that they had at the time. So in comes the complaints from Superior, Wisconsin. Now, uh, this gentleman on the left is Cadwallader C. Washburn. I believe I pronounced that correctly. My bad if there's any Wisconsinites who disagree. Um, but he is a very important figure in this whole tale. He was the one, um, he was a representative for Wisconsin at the time. And actually he was a major businessman like Jay Cook. Um, he was actually the one who um, laid the groundwork for the founding of General Mills, a huge company even today for flour milling and uh, providing, you know, cereal and all that sort of thing. And he also was involved in railroads. So he's not just a politician, but a big um, businessman. And soon after the canal started construction, he sent a letter to the Corps of Engineers, us at the time, and um, dated on September 13th. And he was basically calling attention to a canal which was being cut across Minnesota Point near the harbor of Superior, Wisconsin, which if completed would, in his opinion, ruin the entrance to the harbor. The work upon the cut should be immediately stopped because a canal made across Minnesota Point were proved seriously detrimental to the navi navigable entrance now improved upon to the United, by the United States. So what, what is he talking about specifically? So here's Superior's argument. They were mainly arguing that if um, a canal or water was able to flow out to the lake here at, at this point, um, there would be a major issue where um, if the water from the St. Louis River was to divert this way, their entry would be filled in with sand and they wouldn't be able to have ships come through. And of course, that would be a major issue um, because they would not, the docks that they have down here would no longer get business. And because the Army Corps of Engineers had already uh, invested money into maintaining this entry, um, we, he was arguing that we wouldn't like that either. We would be losing money, basically. So um, in comes this idea that there should be a dike or wall built um, so that this part of the, the harbor would stay separate from the rest of it so that this entry would stay um, clear for ships coming through. So another little interactive portion, a little discussion, just asking one quick question. If the canal is built with Duluth's railroad connection in mind, what do you think will happen to Superior's business? Um, and again, also thinking that uh, Washburn here is a huge businessman himself. So what, what do you think would happen to um, the ship traffic? I'll give you guys a minute. I'm seeing some good answers already. Mm -hmm. Yep, so basically um, the answers I'm seeing here, um, that is definitely true. Um, the What they're probably more worried about is that um, they would lose uh, business. Um, they were worried about that Duluth would create competition with the building of this canal since ships would have easier access to the Duluth side where there's a railroad connection um, that would draw pretty much all the shipping business away. So you're right, it would decrease. Um, so that would be a big deal. A uh, big money loss to Superior, which is the reason why Washburn is arguing against that. So that's probably the main reason why um, they were making that um, complaint um, at the time. It's all about money. So any quick questions so far, again, um, from when, what I just talked about here? I'll give you a minute. Anything that didn't make any sense or wasn't straightforward? All right, I'll keep moving here. So the next section, fact versus fiction. So um, if anyone's familiar with Duluth's history, there is a lot of local legends that surround um, the canal's finish, um, spring of 1871, surrounding the fight with Superior and everything. So I wanted to go through quick to talk about local legends and to give you guys a chance to see if you could figure out what looks like a local ed legend and what doesn't. And this photo here actually shows the uh, dock construction um, in the late 1860s where that green elevator was sitting, elevator A. So that's kind of a 
cool photo I wanted to show you. And it's connected to the canal's construction where these guys were uh, working on it. So before we get to the legend part, this is what happened. So um, as I mentioned, the Ishpeming is digging uh, the canal to the lake. They had to stop work in winter. Um, so um, they were expecting to start work again once things fallout, thawed out um, in April. So oh, during that time, uh, General Andrew Humphreys, the uh, chief of engineers, um, and the Corps of Engineers in general did side with Superior. They did think that it made sense that um, they wouldn't want to lose money on the entry being filled in after all the effort they put into it. So um, basically, um, General Andrew Humphreys and the Corps of Engineers said uh, to the local engineers in the area that once you see digging start, let us know because we'll probably send some kind of order to stop it. Now, of course, there you can see him siding with uh, Washburn's argument there. So it was reported on April 24th by the uh, local Corps of Engineers Major Houston um, that the digging started get, again to finish the canal. They were pretty close to the lake, but they weren't quite done. An injunction order is sent to Duluth that same day via St. Paul. Of course, it would take some time to get there, but what is an injunction order? An injunction order is a court order requiring a person or city in this case uh, to stop doing something. So they want them to stop building the canal because they think that the superior entry could get filled in and the government would lose money and uh, lost work basically maintaining that entry for ships coming in and out. So before we get to the legend, what is a legend? Um, basically a story or tale that is believed and as told by a real person, event, or place. So a lot of, uh, in history, it's pretty common to find local legends in local history or urban myths as we call them today. Um, and this is again, another cool uh, photo of Duluth in the early 1870s as this is all uh, going on. And these are some things I want you guys to kind of keep in mind when I show you these three different stories is what you're looking for um, when you can spot a local legend or urban myth, um, some characteristics. So usually a local legend is simple, easy to understand, so it's easy to retell. Um, sometimes it can be unexpected, grab people's attention by surprise. Um, easy to remember again so that um, people can actually retell the story. Um, credible. So like kind of as an urban myth would start, I heard from my cousin, I heard from my friend, this happened. Um, that's also possible. Um, it can be emotional, dramatic again to catch people's attention. And of course, these are all stories. So. All right, so here are going to be the three stories. And again, I want you guys to think about those characteristics and see if you can spot which one is the true story, what actually happened. So the first one here, warned that the injunction would arrive in a few days' time, Duluth city leaders ordered every man, woman, and child who could handle a shovel to help dig the canal and fin finish it before the injunction order arrives. The soldier from St. Paul tasked to deliver it arrives just as the first boat, first boat travels through. Or is it the second one? The steam dredger Ishpeming encountered some frozen gravel just uh, before reaching the lake. Workers were ordered to shovel and blast through the gravel to help finish the canal, and the injunction order arrived a week after the canal reached the lake. Or is it three, um, warned that the injunction order would arrive the next day, Duluth businesses and go, businessmen go out in secret to finish digging the canal overnight. As morning approached, they called for dynamite to speed the process. The blast broke every window in Duluth, but the canal reached the lake in time. So what do you guys think? Which one is the true story? of these three and I'll give you a second. And if you'd like to, you could also think, say your thoughts on why, um, if you have any thoughts as to why that one in particular. <laughs> yep, uh, with Stephanie's comment there, yeah, so you guys are right on. It's number two. That is what actually happened. Um, as was said, um, the other two stories are actual legends that were retold in the late 1800s and early 1900s um, that came from Duluth's founders. And uh, these, both one and three, are way more dramatic. Um, easier to remember because they are more dramatic and interesting. The second one is pretty boring um, compared to the other two. 
And um, it's a lot more realistic to think that in the 1870s, it took a while um, for an injunction order to arrive that was sent up from St. Paul. Um, so, but this is what actually happened. Basically, the Ishpeming ran into some frozen gravel, knowing that they did have to get it done. Um, they just had some workers come out to shovel and blast it to finish it. And then the injunction order did arrive a week later um, in the first week of May, I believe, of 1871. So very good. So this legend form in the first place. Uh, this is a good example of that legend um, from the a story that was written in the 1940s in the uh, Sunday Tribune. And with that same legend, Duluth citizens worked all night in defiance of the U.S. government to dig the famous Duluth Ship Canal. Um, but as I said, it was officially finished on April 30th, and the first small boat was able, able to pass through. It wasn't done yet. They had to keep working on making it deeper for big ships. Um, the legends formed many years later, as I said, as Duluth's port and importance grew. And what's interesting is at the time, because of Duluth becoming this big port, they were hoping that Duluth would become the next Chicago. So um, Duluth's founders wanted a good story um, that made the, this important event more dramatic. Um, it's kind of more cool as a big city to have this kind of dramatic founding uh, story. Any questions so far? Again, anything related to um, what we just talked about with the local legends. And I'll give you guys a minute. Thanks again for, uh, by the way, for all the um, participation. Makes the program a lot more interesting and fun having people uh, make comments. So we'll keep moving. All right, so the canal is dug the injunction order arrives for them to stop the construction, but it's already done, so there's nothing that can be done. Well, it's not done there yet. Superior actually still argued that the canal should be filled in, again, for the same reason, that the superior entry could be filled in from the current being rerouted. But again, as we know, it was more about competition. So that's uh, that year. Um, the Duluth attorney in... Um, or the attorney in Duluth, James J. A. Egan, um, he sent a letter to the Corps of Engineers saying that, asking, if you allow us to build that dike that was proposed, um, would you allow the canal to uh, exist? And would the injunction order go away? They said yes. So um, over the winter into 1872, they built this long um, dike or wall uh, across the harbor to separate Duluth and Superior to appease the um, people in Superior on the other side. Here's another quick photo of what that looked like. It was pretty crudely built. They used a lot of different material, anything that they could. It was really long. Um, it was um, over, I believe, um, it might have been close to a mile or so. It, or it was, it was really, really long, so it did take a lot of effort. And, of course, in the picture, um, this is Rice's Point um, on the other side, and then we have Superior and the canal. If you were to look to the right, it would be that direction. So that was completed. But was Superior happy? No, of course not, because um, obviously if I were in their position too, I would be mad about the whole situation. But um, So they actually changed their mind in 1873. They wanted that dike to be removed after all that effort. Well, why? Because they were now complaining that the ships could not, um, that were arriving through their entry, they did not have access to the Duluth docks, again, because they only have the railroad access. So um, they kept arguing again and again, fill in the canal, we don't want to deal with this anymore. So later in that year, in 1873, I believe, um, Washburn met up with Jay Cook's um, president for the Northern uh, Pacific, George W. Cass, to make a deal um, to end this whole fight. And um, basically, George W. Cass and the Northern Pacific Railroad basically said, we will build a railroad connection to Superior so that um, competition is equal. And Washburn thought that that was a good um, compromise. And um, um, that was supposed to end the fighting there, but um, it did return. The Northern Pacific um, actually lost a lot of money a year uh, that same year in 1873 um, due to a financial crisis, so they weren't able to fulfill that deal. So 
Superior kept pushing on the issue until it was finally ended in 1877. Why did it take so long um, to get to the Supreme Court for the final time? It took a while just because they needed witness testimony. And in the 1870s, it took a long time to get that stuff. But basically, Judge S.F. Miller of the Supreme Court um, argued um, with this case um, that when Congress appropriates $10,000, they were actually putting in money to, to keep the canal dug um, at Duluth. They were basically arguing since they put in money that um, it wouldn't make sense to obstruct or fill in the canal. So that ended the argument officially um, and that the state of Wisconsin didn't have a good argument here um, for getting rid of it. So um, Duluth won out on that um, whole fight. And now moving on, how did the Corps of Engineers step in? How did we get involved with taking care of it? Well, um, like I said, uh, the Panic of 1873, it was a major economic meltdown that happened in the country. And uh, Jay Cook, who was the richest in the country at the time, lost a lot of money um, to the point that all, everything he invested money into, including uh, Duluth and the railroads he was invested in, um, it all came to a screeching halt, all the development, all the building that was going on. So um, because of this, um, Duluth actually um, didn't, could not afford to take care of the canal anymore. There was work that needed to be done to keep it dug, to keep it dredged, um, so that ships could come in and out of the Duluth entry to have access to the harbor. So the Corps of Engineers basically took unofficial ownership of it um, in 1874, officially, the next year because of that bankruptcy. And now a little bit on the history of the shipping that's come through here. Um, the ship you actually see on the left, this is the very first large commercial ship that came through the canal in 1871 when it was dug, the steamer Norman. It was a package freighter, meaning that it would, uh, it also ferried uh, passengers as well, but it would take packages to and from on the Great Lakes, uh, a lot of different cargoes. It was only 137 feet long, so it was pretty small, but um, comparing that, it's kind of amazing to compare that to today's thousand footers. Um, like the Paul Archer Gertha, a huge difference. Shipping has changed a lot over 150 years. And the Paul Archer Gertha, of course, is 1,013 feet long. It's the largest ship here on the Great Lakes. <clears throat> because Duluth grew to become the biggest port on the Great Lakes and the busiest, um, in 1902 alone, the busiest year for ships coming through, there were 7,933 vessel transits, meaning ships coming through um, that only during that season, which is a huge amount, um, a lot different compared to uh, last year uh, when we only had about 754 ships coming through the canal. Um, but uh, the reason for the big difference in um, the number of vessels is that today's ships are a lot bigger and more efficient um, than the ships that were operating back in 1902. And there's actually, I believe, less cargo being um, shipped today than there was back in the early 1900s. So, um, and then I was actually able to find data ever since the canal was built in 1871, there's been 4,303 or 433,000, excuse me, 576 vessel transits in 150 years time. So um, it's kind of a huge, amazing number of how much shipping traffic we've had come through here um, during that time. So getting into um, what the Corps of Engineers did with the canal, how they maintained it. Um, this is one of the earliest photos showing the canal when it was first built. Um, what One of the first things that happened after that canal was dug is that they built wooden piers on either side to kind of keep the canal in place so that it didn't fill in with sand and to keep it um, so that the ships could actually come through. And the Corps of Engineers mostly dealt with um, dealing with those piers and dredging um, the canal so that was deep enough for ships. This is kind of a close-up um, of what these wooden piers looked like. They were pretty simple structures, although um, in the late 1800s the Corps of Engineers had a lot of issues maintaining them. Um, because they were built of wood, they were easily damaged um, by either um, tugs, towing, um, barges, or log rafts, or 
um, the piers themselves, the uh, foundations for them weren't actually built correctly. So um, this, the North Pier here, um, where that black and white lighthouse stands today, um, caused the Corps of Engineers a lot of issues, both sides. So eventually um, they looked for a solution. What could we do to make this easier so that we're, we're not taking so much time and effort to be uh, fixing these piers each year? This is the South Pier in the late 1890s. Uh, we have a steam tug towing a sailing vessel through. Again, um, because of these barges, they would easily um, run into the sides here. So, And this is actually a walkway um, that went out to the early lighthouse that was built out at the end of the South Pier. So. Um, it wasn't until the late 1890s when the Corps of Engineers um, was able to get funding for an upgrade. And um, in 1896 specifically, um, they were able to secure funding from Congress to make some major adjustments. So this uh, map here shows what these old wooden piers look like down here. And they wanted to build two long uh, concrete piers that would be easier to maintain and keep the canal in place. Um, the canal itself was originally only about 200 feet wide. Um, with the new construction, it would be about 300 feet wide and it was extended about 200 feet and this would be uh, 1600 feet total. So it's a huge, huge structure. And this is kind of what that old concrete pier structure looked like, uh, the plans for it. So we had uh, wooden pilings going into the ground. And here is kind of the concrete section that went on top. What's really interesting I like to point out is there's this little tunnel um, that was built on the south pier. And what this tunnel was for was that they were going to be able to have a lighthouse keeper on a small um, basically a track and a cart, he would be, he or she, the light keeper at the time, would be able to travel through this tunnel inside the pier all the way to the end of the lighthouse when it was too stormy to walk out there. So um, it was eventually found out, though, that that tunnel uh, leaked a lot of water, so they didn't end up using it as much as they thought. But it was kind of a interesting and cool idea. And that tunnel still exists down there today, but it's pretty much filled in. They uh, ended up totally filling it in so that uh, it couldn't be used. So like I said, this was a major project, um, rebuilding the piers to concrete in the late 1890s and early 1900s. This gentleman here, Major Clinton B. Sears, was kind of the head of the project. He designed the piers, and uh, he was the one that put in a lot of effort to um, proving to Congress that ne this needed to be done. And the way he did that is he did a study um, showing that in 1896 alone, there was $100 million worth of cargo coming through the canal alone in one season, which is pretty amazing. I don't know what how much that would be in today's money, but um, he was able to help secure that funding and designed um, the construction. And it, over that time period of about um, six years, um, it took about a 1,000 workers to put in this canal. And they actually started with the South Pier first, um, this is where the bridge would be and uh, where our visitor center here is on the right. So um, they built one pier first and then they went over to the north pier. And this is that old uh, wooden pier that I was talking about that was first uh, constructed for the canal and the lighthouses um, that used to exist there. Um, these huge concrete blocks um, were kind of put in um, at intervals and each of them weighed about 14,000 pounds each. So pretty massive. Um, project that was going on. And this is what the canal looked like in the early 1900s after that project was done. You'll kind of notice on the left hand side the northern uh, pier lighthouse isn't there yet. So this is um, before 1909 when it was constructed. Um, it was at this time that the canal became more of a tourist attraction because you could actually walk out onto the piers um, at the time. And this is a uh, Pittsburgh steamer that was coming in I'm not sure which one, but in the early uh, 1900s. And then, of course, uh, Duluth's major icon, the aerial lift bridge, was built over the canal so that uh, residents on Minnesota Point could get over on the other side, and also because of 
tourism. A lot of people are being attracted to the area and going across to the peninsula. So um, this photo was taken in 1904 uh, during its construction. I just thought it was a really cool photo showing how much ice it built up along the sides here. And we also have the South Pier Inner Range Lighthouse that still stands today um, near the Aerial Lift Bridge. This is called the Aerial Transfer Bridge, excuse me, at the time, soon to be the Aerial Lift Bridge later on. Again, um, as today, the canal is still a huge tourist attraction. Uh, it was in the early 1900s as well. So you can see the new concrete and some gentlemen here kind of checking it out. Also thought that was a cool photo. And you can see in the back, the aerial transfer bridge is constructed. It's done in 1905. Um, the reason why it was called transfer bridge is because at the time it had a gondola car that would go to and from uh, each side of the canal. Today it's actually a lift bridge, so there's a deck that would go straight up and down instead of a gondola going from side to side. And then of course we get to today's um, canal, what we see today, um, which was that was done in the 1980s as a major project. And basically what they did is they kept the old canal or the old pier structure and they put a cap over it to make it larger. Um, the concrete was um, starting to degrade, so it basically had to be covered and, and uh, replaced in some parts. And they did add some steel uh, siding, um, which you can't see on this next photo here. But this is kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of what it looked like after it was upgraded in the 80s. Um, it was widened by, um, let's see, in my notes here, it was... Um, widened from about 12 feet to 29 feet. So that's a huge, a lot more space uh, for people to use the piers. And the project itself was about $10 million and it took two years time to do it. And that's kind of how we got to the, uh, the piers that we have today here at the canal. A little bit on, here is the modern canal more close up. And again, a little bit on the size of it. Um, it's about 300 feet wide, um, about the size of a football field. So it's big enough for the large thousand footers that come through. They take up about a third of the canal. They're about 100 feet wide. And then it's about uh, 1,700 feet long, um, same as the height of the new World Trade Center building in New York City, um, about the same height or so. So it's very long. And then it's about 30 feet deep. Um, a common question we get here at the Visitor Center is how often do we dredge the canal? Well, because of the currents that come in and out from the harbor, it does not uh, need to be dredged very often. Um, they do survey it every year as they're supposed to, but because of that um, current, um, it's actually a lot deeper than the rest of the canal or the rest of the harbor um, where other dredging usually needs to be done. So one quick uh, interactive question here, why did the Corps of Engineers become responsible for the canal? Um, was it A, Jay Cook, who invested heavily in Duluth, went bankrupt during the Panic of 1873? The city was then unable to maintain the canal themselves, so the government took responsibility. Or is it B, they just started doing it one year? Or C, is it since they were already maintained the superior entry, it made sense that they would take care of Duluth as well? What do you guys think? Yep, so I see a little bit of consensus. I would see why you'd think um, C would be the answer, but I was looking more for A. Um, it is true that um, the Corps of Engineers did eventually take care of the Duluth Canal because, you know, it's a part of their job. But more directly, it's about uh, the Panic of 1873. The city owned it at that point, and then when it went bankrupt um, was the reason that the government took over and started to maintain it. Any quick questions so far? We're almost to the end here. So um, I'll kind of have a last slide for major questions, but um, it doesn't look like it, so we'll keep going. So one final quiz going over everything we've talked about, um, a little bit different things. So starting out with what led to its construction, what are the four factors do you think that led to the canal's construction? Was it A, corn, railroads, Jay Cook, and Lake Superior, B, Railroads, J. Cook, Wheat, and Lake Superior, or C. Wheat, uh, Washburn, who we talked about, Railroads, and Lake Superior. Yep, I'm seeing a consensus. It is B. 
Um, all those four factors combined it kind of led to its construction. I saw a question that I can address here real quick. Uh, the railroad that reached Duluth got done in 1870. And um, that was the same year that Duluth was founded. The canal was actually, the construction started not too long after. It actually finished um, construction up to Duluth in August 1st of 1870. So we just passed that 150th anniversary for the railroad arriving up here. Moving on, uh, what is the real reason why Superior City didn't want Duluth to build a canal? A, they feared the entry that led to their harbor would be filled in with silt. B, they feared the canal would create competition for business. Or C, they were mad Duluth got a railroad connection before they did. B, yes. So although C is technically true, I'm more looking for um, the, what we talked about in that little discussion is that they feared competition. They didn't want um, Duluth taking away from their business. And, and they were right. I mean, 1874, a few years after the canal was built, um, the Superior Entry had no business whatsoever when the Duluth Entry had a bunch of ships coming in and out. So they had a right to, they were definitely had the right idea that they were afraid of that happening. Um, but Superior on the other side did eventually develop into a major harbor as well. And today it's one harbor of Duluth and Superior. I noticed that they, let's see. Yep, addressing your question, Stephanie. Um, yeah, there, there was some merit to it. In fact, the Corps of Engineers at the time, like I said, um, did believe the same thing. Um, but uh, of course, technology at the time, they didn't know for sure what was going to happen. So um, there was, like you said, there was merit to it. But in fact, when the canal was built, it actually helped um, with the currents going in and out of the harbor. They actually helped the superior entry to be um, dredged further or not dredged, but um, the currents actually deepened, um, naturally deepened the, the superior entry, which I forgot to mention as well. So the exact opposite happened to what they were uh, worried about. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, number three, quick, why did local legends form around the canal's construction? Was it A, as Duluth's importance grew, the construction became uh, dramatized? B, Duluthians wanted to tell a good entertaining story? C, to prove that Duluth is better than Superior? Or D, both A and B? Yes, correct, everybody. So it's um, both about, um, it became um, the city's founders wanted a more dramatic story and more entertaining story because Duluth had become such a major port city. They wanted it to become the next Chicago. So um, these stories kind of, it wasn't necessarily done on purpose. It kind of, that's just how humans um, um, come up with these legends is for those, for those kind of reasons, how these get passed around and exist today. Then finally, last question, what have the Corps of Engineers done to maintain the canal? A, they upgraded and expanded the piers over time to protect the canal, which was progressively dredged to a deeper depth. B, they operated the lighthouses to make sure ships wouldn't damage the piers. Or C, they built the aerial transfer lift bridge so that residents could get across while ships could go still go underneath. And while you guys are um, making the answer here to, to answer your question, Bob, um, the ships do not pay a toll. It's totally free for them to come underneath or uh, through the canal. Um, and it's also the, the bridge doesn't um, charge a fee also. It, um, it's totally free for the large commercial vessels and the smaller vessels that come through here. And uh, I just as address the question, A is correct. Um, they did not operate the lighthouses. The U.S. Coast Guard operated the lighthouses, and the city of Duluth actually built the bridge. Um, they did, uh, the Corps of Engineers did have a lot to say of how, what the design should be, but we didn't physically build it. A little bit on the sources, of course. And then last, uh, we're kind of at the end of the program here, so if you have any last-minute questions, I'll uh, get to the question I see here. Um, So it, it might be, a you might have gotten a little bit confused on what I was talking about. So there was, before the canal was built, there was nothing here. Um, there was, I believe, a dock that was built nearby, but um, the there wasn't any way for the ships to go through. Um, 
there were some uh, piers built eventually at the superior entry um, for ships coming through. Um, there are piers there today like there are here. Um, it's very common for um, structures like that to be built at harbor entrances. Any last minute questions, anybody, um, on anything we talked about today? Let's see. Which entry gets the most traffic today and why? Well, uh, typically the Duluth entry still gets uh, most of the shipping traffic. And the reason why is because um, the, um, a lot of the harbor docks that were eventually built inside the harbor were closer to the Duluth entry. Um, so as time went on, more and more ships came through Duluth rather than Superior. But Duluth, the Superior entry, I'd say, gets about a third or so of the traffic. So they still get a lot of ships coming in and out that way. Uh, another question I'll address here. Did the gondola carry only people or was it large enough to carry vehicles across? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I'm guessing we will eventually do a virtual program on the history of the bridge, so we'll talk about that at some point. But um, the gondola was big enough to carry a few vehicles across. Um, it could carry um, several hundred people even, so it was a pretty large structure. But because over time cars became more popular, they needed a lift bridge instead of a transfer bridge uh, to help get those across. Um, Let's see what shipwrecks are near the canal. Um, that is a good question. Um, uh, that would be kind of an extensive answer. Um, there are definitely a few. Um, one of them is the whale back. Uh, Thomas Wilson, we had one of our rangers, Casey, did a presentation on this a few weeks ago. And um, that is about a mile outside of it. There's also... Um, a ship that wrecked just outside of the South Pier in the 1880s. So um, let's see, one more question. And you guys are welcome. Thank you guys for being here um, to watch the presentation. Um, again, if you'd like to rewatch it, it's going to be posted on YouTube. But I'll keep, if you guys want to, you know, um, sign off, I'll kind of continue to answer questions uh, before we wrap it up. Um, why would a ch captain choose one entry over the other? Um, it's usually how close, oh, Tom Holden, of course. Hi, Tom. Um, it's usually with how close the dock is to the entry. So a lot of the docks um, distance-wise are closer to the Duluth entry, depending on what they're going to. Um, and since they have to go really slow in the harbor, it just basically saves time. And um, I've also heard that the superior entry, you can't actually load as much cargo going through you there. so usually makes more sense um, for, for most ships coming through. Um, the ships that usually use the superior entry are ones that go to the Burlington Northern Iron Ore Dock, uh, Iron Ore Pellet Dock, so. Scott, before you continue, I just want to um, be able to update everyone on our visitor center statuses if, before we lose everyone. <laughs> so I'm just gonna take back the screen mm -hmm. real quick. Um, before you continue. So if everyone can hang tight, I'm just going to transfer that over and then yep. we'll continue with questions. All right. I believe everybody can see the screen. Is that correct, Scott? <laughs> um, yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure because I've got a couple of monitors going. Um, so again, thank you for that presentation, Ranger Scott. Um, at this time, I just wanted to update everyone on what's going on with the visitor centers and how we're continuing with COVID. Uh, the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center here in Duluth is continuing to do vessel arrival and departure announcements. Um, we have a cell phone sewer that we will have signs up for uh, shortly, and that is currently running where you, you can use the QR code or call in. We have a virtual online tour of the museum that you can 3D tour uh, the museum online. Outdoor guest services where we're answering questions on the table you see in the picture, and then outdoor uh, gift shop, which is located around the side of the building. For the Sulax Visitor Center in uh, Sioux, St. Marie, Michigan, uh, exhibits are sold in the park, uh, the vessel uh, schedule arrival announcements and departure announcements as well. 
um, outdoor guest services and a scavenger hunt for children. So another interactive feature with kiddos going back to school. And again, we will be um, assessing these as conditions um, improve and kind of keep everyone updated as best we can through our social media platforms. As I promised at the beginning of this presentation, here's some uh, links that you can copy and paste uh, for our Facebook pages, um, our, our association pages, our YouTube channel, um, our hotlines if you want updates on the, on the vessels that day and when they're coming in and out, harborlookout.com, of course, another uh, form to see the vessel schedule. And then if you'd like to join our email list, uh, go ahead and, and shoot an email to hello, hello lsmbc at gmail.com. And of course, it would be appreciated if you could uh, copy that link at the bottom. I will post it in the chat in just a moment uh, for the survey. It, it will only take three minutes and it helps us improve future programs. So now, Scott, if you can continue to answer questions, that would be fantastic. All righty, let's see. I'm just going to look um, quick. Again, if you guys have any last minute questions, um, we'll be here for a little bit. Otherwise, um, we will kind of wrap things up. Yes, as a good question, Virtual Visitor Center. Um, it has been uh, throughout the years. I don't have specific dates and depths, but um, over time, as the uh, ships got larger and to be able to um, uh, ship more cargo with these larger ships, the uh, canal and the rest of the harbor as well, um, were dredged to be deeper and deeper to today's kind of standard of 27 to 30 feet. Um, that last major change came with the um, building, or at least the uh, dredging for the St. Lawrence Seaway, which was completed in 1959. Um, so that's kind of the standard depth we've had since then. But um, it takes a lot of time and money uh, to get it even a few feet deeper throughout the harbor since we have 18 miles worth of channels. Did they find anything cool digging the canal or dredging? I don't believe so. That's a good question. Um, because uh, the Ojibwe in the area actually more, there was a lot of Ojibwe that settled on Minnesota Point, but I don't believe they would have found anything um, because Europeans settled in the area only a year or two earlier permanently. Um, there were earlier settlements, but um, I don't think anything was found. How fast is the current through the canal? Um, it depends. It changes on a dime, um, which is really interesting. I read a letter that was um, done right after the canal was constructed, and they made the same exact observation that the, the currents here will change um, just automatically. So they're usually not that strong, um, maybe a few miles per hour. There's actually a light, a stoplight kind of thing on the bridge that ships can see, and they can tell via what, um, light, what color light it is um, for how fast the current is going in what direction. Um, but during, usually when we get a lot of, a lot, a lot of rain, um, there can be a faster current because of the harbor being higher up, or the water in the harbor being higher up in the lake um, from all that extra rain. So it can kind of depend. So only a few miles per hour typically, if anything. Um, on really calm days when we haven't had a lot of rain, there will be no current whatsoever sometimes. How many ships have gone through the canal this year? Ah, that's a really good question. I, um, I have not tallied that up yet. Um, a lot less, I think, than last year so far due to the market conditions from uh, um, COVID. Uh, we've actually had less traffic this year, so I'm guessing um, nowhere, not quite as much as uh, we did the same time last year. So uh, I think uh, I think several hundred at least, though, for sure. Um, how big do the waves get in the canal? Yes. So um, during big storms that we get out here, 
Um, the waves can get up to 15 feet or so or more, um, especially the last few years we've had huge um, storms. So um, that's just barely tall enough to touch the bottom of where the bridge sits. So um, it's pretty amazing if any, any of you have been around um, to see that. All right, if no one else has any other questions for Ranger Scott, thank you again for answering those for us. Um, we hope to see you next week for our uh, virtual visitor center program, Waterways, Wetlands, and Why You Need a Permit. Um, otherwise, stay safe.